truly bask in your goodness and trust you and thank you, Lord, for, for feeding us with your divine word today as we dive into it. Open up our uh, hearts and our ears and our voices just as you did with the, uh, the man born deaf today. And we may uh, speak your word, speak your truth, know your truth. We ask this in Jesus' saving name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. I brought show and tell. I brought a bunch of books. All right. We got lots of books today. Lots of books. So we, uh, obviously, we are in cycle B. When does the uh, liturgical cycle change? Advent. When does Advent begin? First Sunday of Advent. <laughs> that was a... <laughs> This is helpful. Yeah, usually Sunday after Thanksgiving, obviously, but uh, tech, I mean, typically, I, in my brain, I always think of it as Christ the King because we don't hear the typical readings there at, um, at, uh, at, at uh, Christ the King. Those are, those are special readings. So that, that Sunday right after Thanksgiving usually is Christ the, right around that time, Christ the King, and then uh, Advent begins. So we are in cycle B. Literally, just think of it this way, we're in cycle B, we're in Mark's gospel, until Thanksgiving, okay? We took that little hiatus, if you will, for five weeks, not last Sunday, but the Sunday before, for five weeks, uh, where we dove into John chapter 6, the Bread of Life discourse, where it was uh, really, uh, where I a preached a preaching series on the Eucharist, and, um, and, uh, and, and that, that way there. So these are, uh, I'll set these over here, you guys can take a look at these. Um, so these are uh, different commentaries on cycle B. So there's uh, A, B, and C, different commentaries. So this is a theologian named uh, John Berksma. Anyone ever heard of him? He's really, really good. Uh, he teaches at Ave Maria University. Uh, so he's, a, he's a, a, a faithful guy. His son, uh, God, God rest, I believe his son just died, a young, young boy. Um, so that's why I heard that recently. Uh, so this is, it's very good. Short, shorter uh, than this. So this is Peter Kreft. I've recommended this before. Generous, uh, generous benefactor here in the parish bought this for me. Um, so cycle B. So Peter Kreft is a, uh, is a philosopher. And uh, so Bishop Barron, uh, so they're um, C.S. Lewis, was it C.S. Lewis? It might have been G.K. Chesterton. G.K. Chesterton, who is a... No, it was C.S. Lewis. So C.S. Lewis, who is a, uh, a philosopher, a theologian, a Christian man, not a Catholic, did commentary on the scriptures, and, and it's really good. So Bishop Barron went to Peter Kreft, who is the truly the um, 21st, 20th, 21st century... C.S. Lewis, just a profound Catholic theologian and philosopher, very accessible. Like all of his writing is is rich, but it's accessible to, to normal people. I mean that in, in kindness. Uh, so Bishop Barron went to him and said, "Before you die, he's in his he's in his late seventies, eighties now," and said, "Before you die, leave." the people of God with a legacy of the scripture. So this is the first stuff he's ever written on the sacred scripture. So it's put, it's put out by, uh, um, by um, Bishop Barron's Word on Fire. And uh, so this is a three, three cycle series of that. Our, uh, more recently, so there was something that came out in the 1980s called the Navarre Bible Study Bible Series. Anyone ever heard of the Navarre Bible Studies? They're good. They're not, um, not theologically incorrect by any means. They're good. They really are. So they, were, they came out of Spain, Navarre, Spain. If I'm, is that a place in Spain? I believe so. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, no one's really correcting me, so we're all either right or wrong. <laughs> we're all wrong together on our geography. Fine. If our, I, I think it's a, it's a place in Spain. Uh, so so there, there is a a new commentary that came out that was headed up by Catholics here in Detroit, actually, uh, called the, uh, the Catholic Commentary on Sacred Scripture. Um, so our very own Dr. Mary Healy, who teaches here at Sacred Heart Major Seminary, Dr. Peter Williamson, and um, 
there's another doctor here. I can't remember his scripture. Uh, the three of them went in together and they, uh, they did this. It's produced by, or published. And these, these are very good. Baker Academic Press out of Grand Rapids. So, um, but they, they have other, so those three were the first three that came out. And then um, they have different scripture theologians for all the different books of the Bible. And so this is the Catholic commentary on sacred scripture, the Go Gospel of Mark by Dr. Mary Healy. It's, uh, it's very, very good. And she, again, just goes verse by verse. I think though, that series is really good because it's phenomenal. It's always, it goes through each gospel. It, yep. Uh, yep. Verse by verse. Verse by and verse. It will tell you what Old Testament reading yeah. ties into that. Yep. It will tell you what catechism anchors yep. ties into it. So it's you know, very powerful. <laughs> Yeah. Really yeah. It, it's very, very good. It's very, very, very good. Uh, and then, lastly, lastly, this if you've if you've been on my website yet, raise your hand if you've been to my website, fathersteve.net. Good. On there, I have a favorites page. Uh, my favorite, uh, my favorite books, my favorite uh, favorite adult beverages, and <laughs> um, favorite churches. And uh, under my favorite books, I have this listed as one of my favorite books. Memoirs of St. Peter. So again, I mean, it's, it sounds like it's about literally about St. Peter, but, um, but it, what it is, is this Michael Pekholuk, Pekholuk, I'm sorry, he teaches at Ave Maria University. John Berksmeyer teaches at Steubenville. Yeah, I mixed him up. He's a Steubenville guy. So he's a, but his, his son did just die. <laughs> uh, God rest his soul. He teaches at Ave Maria. So, um, the uh, uh, so it, it's it's his translation of Mark's gospel from the voice of Saint Peter. So uh, so Saint Peter, so Mark's gospel. Let's just start there. So Mark's gospel, the gospel of Saint Mark, is the um, which again what we're working through is the memoirs of Saint Peter. So Mark was, St. Mark wasn't alive uh, when he, oh, I'm sorry, I shouldn't say he wasn't alive. He didn't, he wasn't there. He didn't follow Jesus. Uh, he, uh, he didn't, uh, he didn't hear Jesus speak. He may have perhaps in, in the crowd, but he wasn't one of Jesus's direct disciples. He wasn't one of his apostles. Mark was a, uh, was a disciple of St. Paul. So Mark follow her probably we don't know but here's the gospel preached by saint paul becomes a disciple of paul and then joins paul on missionary trips we hear about that in the book of acts then it's barnabas i believe right so i'm sorry yeah so barnabas has a has a has a fight with not a fist fight but has a has a falling out with with Saint Paul, and Saint Paul says to Mark, he's like, "Who is this jabroni?" Second time he uses, "Who is this jabroni? You know, who is this guy that you're bringing around? Kick him out of here. Let's go on our next journey." And Mark says, "No, no, 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 no. I'm taking Barnabas with me, and I'm going this way." So then Mark and Barnabas go, and they start preaching the gospel. That Paul gets a little upset. He grabs. Timothy or whomever else, and they go this way, right? They have a, their own, not, I mean, listen, we heard about that a little bit in the first, go, first reading, this, this today, you know, that there's tension, there's always gossip, there's issues. So they go their own separate ways, they make up in the end, and they, they come back together. We hear about that in, um, in, in later letters too, I believe. So Mark, uh, Mark begins to shadow St. Peter. And he, we don't specifically, again, hear this in the gospel, but, um, but we know from other ancient writings, uh, actually one of them is quoted in here. Look at that, let me quote it for you. Uh, look at this one. So it's from Flavain, give me a second, bear with me. Please be here, please be here. So, 
Yeah, so this is, um, uh, this is the church historian Eusebius quotes Pap Papias, Bishop of Heropolis, in, from 60 AD. <laughs> He quotes this bishop from 60 AD. So uh, Eusebius was a, a great church historian, um, or he was, he was just a historian, and he wrote a lot about uh, church history. I'm sorry, uh, Bishop Papias lived from 60 AD to 120 AD, so he quotes him from within that time. And so he says, Mark, having become the interpreter of St. Peter, wrote down accurately, though not indeed in perfect order, whatsoever he remembered of the things done or said by Christ. For he neither heard the Lord nor followed him, but afterward, as I said, he followed Peter, Bishop of Rome, and adapted his teaching to the needs of his hearers, but with no intention of giving a connected account of the Lord's discourses, so that Mark committed no error, while thus he wrote some things as he remembered them. And that, that's from that's from the the, the the hundreds, and so we know we know that uh, that uh, that that Peter was was behead or it was crucified upside down in Rome. So we are able to trace at least the earliest copies of St. Mark back, the Gospel of Mark back to 70 AD. So we're at least, so they, they, and they can pinpoint that to 70 to 73 AD, something like that. So it's believed, again, that Mark's Gospel is the, is the oldest, right? Those are the, those are the most extant versions that we have, that we can trace it back. So isn't it amazing? Good little intro. So uh, let's dive into our, uh, our first reading. Our first reading comes to us all the way from Isaiah, our Old Testament prophet extraordinaire, Isaiah 35. The prophet Isaiah 35. Who's going to read for us? We're all there? Isaiah 35? What was the verses? I'm sorry. Isaiah 35, 4 through 7. The readings of Isaiah. Thus says the Lord, say to those whose hearts are frightened, be strong, fear not. Here is your God. He comes with vindication. With divine recompense, he comes to save you. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened, the ears of the deaf be cleared. Then will the lame leap like a stag, and the tongue of the mute will sing. Streams will burst forth in the desert, and rivers in the steppe. The burning sands will become pools, and the thirsty ground springs of water. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be God. to God. So Isaiah is going to tie in pretty closely to, uh, to, to the gospel reading. Does anyone have just any initial thoughts on it other than tying it into the gospel? Even the fear not, which Jesus so often said, and it's one of the most common, common sayings we have. Yeah. Is your, is your fear not, be not afraid. <laughs> it's good for this time. Yeah, I know. <laughs> you know, it's funny. I was, uh, I, don't, I don't want to talk too much about myself, but, you know, I, I was, or just in preparation or whatever, but I, uh, I was pretty sure I, I knew what the, uh, what I was wanting or supposed to preach on this week. But then I went back just this morning and I, I read that first reading and I said, what, are you asking me to preach on fear? Right. So, just in that sense of um, of just raising that up to the Lord again, because I sit down with the scriptures Sunday night and Monday, and then just start preparing in, in my heart, letting it rest about what what God is is asking me to say. Um, was moving in one direction, maybe we can splice them together, but um, 
but I was just kind of praying with that just this morning. Because it's exactly, everyone's afraid right now. Everyone's always afraid. That's why God says it constantly. <laughs> God says it constantly. Well, would you not be fearful if you're deaf and blind and lame? You know, I mean, you're, you're totally helpless mm -hmm. and pretty much cut off from society and interaction yeah. with most people, especially yeah. back when this was written. Yeah. It was, you know, very much people were fearful. Yeah. And it's, um, it was originally written, it's all about the Babylonian exile. It was going to happen, and then they were going to be brought back at the end of Isaiah. And it also, the very last part of it, with all the water coming out of all these places where it wasn't expected, goes back to Moses leading them through the desert. And one of the greatest miracles to that point was about water, Amazing. you know, able to... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. have a, a dry path through the Red Sea, mm -hmm. but then also bringing the water forth when they were uh, starving and thirsty. Preach it, sister. <laughs> <laughs> Give me my homily. Yeah, but then, you know, and then, the right, so, forward. yep, the gospel brings it forward, so we, we can, we're f there's fear in being blinded, there's fear in, in, uh, in, in, uh, in not hearing, there's fear in death, but then Jesus Jesus is the hope that, that takes, away, takes away the fear. Which then, you know, our psalm response is, praise the Lord my soul. Psalms 146. The God of Jacob keeps faith forever. He secures justice for the oppressed, gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets captives free. Praise the Lord my soul. Right? We have nothing to fear. The Lord gives sight to the blind. The Lord raises those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the just. The Lord protects strangers. Praise the Lord, my soul. The fatherless and the widow, the Lord sustains. But the way of the wicked he thwarts. The Lord shall reign forever. The God of Zion through all genera generations. Alleluia. Praise the Lord, my soul. So we can only praise him if we know him, if we know what he's done for us. And it's one of the hallelujah psalms that Jesus and the 12 oh, yeah. were singing yeah. as they left the land. Yeah, the good thing, yeah, earth. good, good, I, I wasn't going to point that out, but yeah, good for that, good point out. So we hear in the, in the sacred scriptures that as they left the, uh, as they left the banquet, they sang psalms together, which was part of the, uh, the Passover, uh, the Passover ritual we, you sing a psalm together, you chant a song together. So the other one is they sing a song uh, like after, after they cross over in, um, the Jews cross over in the, the Exodus, Miriam, Moses' sister, sings a song. So it's traditional that they would sing that song to you have parted the ways, you have rescued your people. So it's turned into a, um, into a song. We're now beginning a course to walk our way through James. We, uh, we went through uh, uh, Ephesians a few weeks ago, and now we're walking our way through the book of James. So we're uh, James chapter 2, verse 1 through 5. James 2, 1 through 5. Who's going to read for us? Carolyn. My brothers and sisters, show no partiality as you adhere to the faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ. For if a man with gold rings and fine clothes comes into your assembly, and a poor person in shabby clothes also comes in, and pay you attention to the one with the fine clothes and say, sit here please, while you say to the poor one, stand there or sit at my feet. Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil designs? Listen, my brothers and sisters, did not God choose those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom that he promised to those who love him? The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <coughs> So the book of James is very, sh very short. Uh, 
if, uh, if you've never read the book of James, again, you know, it is a, it is a beautiful re, uh, book to read. If you're only going to read, those of us who have our Bibles, you can just open it up. Just read James chapter 3. I don't know if we're going to get to James 3 in the next couple weeks. Hopefully we do. Um, but if you look at James chapter 3, um, you can see the, head, the header of that is power of the tongue. Sometimes they give that out as a penance in confession. It's, it's short. One, two, three, four. That's four paragraphs. You can read that as you walk around the house chewing bubble gum at the same time. It's very, very simple, very short, but it's powerful. And we just hear that, that the tongue can be weaponized and the tongue unbridled is, is dangerous. So, uh, amen. Moving on to the gospel. Gospel of Mark. So my, my teacher uh, in the seminary who taught us the gospel of Mark was from New, uh, he's from New Jersey. And so he talked like this and he said, he's a Jesuit from New Jersey. And he said, all right, fellas, we're going through the gospel of Mark. The gospel of Mark. Mark, the gospel of Mark. So I literally do that <laughs> the entire year, the gospel of Mark. Saintly, saintly, saintly man. God be with him. All right, Mark chapter 7, verse 31 through 37. Mark 7, 31 through 37. <coughs> Again, Jesus left the district of Tyre and went by way to Sidon, to the Sea of Galilee, into the district of the Decapolis, and people brought to him a deaf man who had a speech impediment and begged him to lay, to lay his hand on him. He took him off by himself away from the crowd. He put his finger into the man's ears and spitting, touched his tongue. Then he looked up to heaven and groaned and said to him, Ephetetha, which is, that is, be opened. And immediately... The man's ears were opened, and his speech impediment was removed, and he spoke plainly. He ordered them not to tell anyone, but the more he ordered them to, not to, the more they proclaimed it. They were exceedingly astonished, and they said, He has done all things well. He makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. So the first thing that we uh, that we that jumps right out to us is that um, is that the uh, the first reading and the gospel are are linked, right? We can see that plainly. We can see that um, uh, we can see that that they're that they're linked here. Um, that Jesus that in the Old Testament uh, in that Old Testament reading. Um, uh, the Lord says, do not let your hearts be. Here is your God who comes without with vindication, divine recompense to save you, to save you. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened and their ears of the deaf be cleared. This is a, this is a prophetic response. Jesus is answering this prophecy, right? It's, it's clear as crystal. This is Jesus, you know, and, and Mark, uh, St. Mark, um, pointing this out, right, that, that the Jews would have known that Isaiah was, um, was prophet, Isaiah had pro proclaimed that this would be a telltale sign of the Messiah, that he would come at this time, that these things he would perform. If you have your Bible, please open it up to Mark 7. So, okay, so last week we ended, we were in Mark 7, and we ended at, we jumped around a little bit, but we ended at verse 21 or 22. So 
what context, 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 okay? So we need to understand where Jesus is at. And I'm sorry, I wish I had time. I, I wanted to try to print out some, uh, some maps. Most Bibles have maps in the back. Um, you know, so you can kind of look at some maps and kind of take a look at them. Um, but uh, so, so Jesus, if we, over in chapter 6, there was the feeding of the 5,000. Jesus walks on water. He heals the Genericet man, the man at Genericet, okay? So then we hear this tradition of the elders, the Jews, they, they argue back and forth, God's commandment, what we preached, what, what we had last week. We skip the healing of the Syrophoenician woman, okay? Why? Yeah, well, she is a dog. We hear it. We hear it in a, We we do hear it in another place. I just wonder if that's why the church. I don't know why. I'm asking you if you know why. But we uh, we skip it here. We do hear it elsewhere throughout the the year. I hope. I know, we, I know we hear it throughout the um, daily Mass, but there is, there is something uh, that's going on here, though. Who are the Syrophoenicians? If you got your map, you can kind of see. So there, look at any map of, of uh, Phonica. Yep. So... Here, I'll let you just, you can just grab my map here. So I'm going to, you want to look at a map like this way, okay? So this is Phoenicia, Phonica, okay? So these are the, these are the, this is where Jesus is at. He's up here in this region, okay? So this is exactly where he's at. Here's the Sea of Galilee down here, okay? So uh, this is, Far, so this is Israel. So this is far from his place. This is far from his home, from his home territory. So here's Samaria. This is Bethlehem, Jericho, Jerusalem. Here's Jerusalem all the way down here, right? Jerusalem's all the way down here. But Jesus is all the way up here in Phonica, okay? So he's out of his home territory. That's so important for us. Context, context, context. So important for us to understand where Jesus is at. Okay? So he heals the Syrophoenician woman. That's why he calls her a dog. Because she's not one of them. It's not just like, it's not just like um, Jesus is hanging out with all of, his, uh, all of his buddies in Jerusalem and there's a Syrophoenician woman who's kind of there hanging out, begging, and he's like, okay, dog, come on, move along. This is, this is my territory. No, Jesus goes into their land, and he calls her a dog in her own backyard, right? And that's a big deal. So now we pick right up with the gospel that we hear. So Jesus heals her. Woman, great is your faith. He heals her, okay? And then what does it say? Again, Jesus left the district of Tyre and Sidon. Okay? Tyre and Sidon. I don't know if we can see that on, on any map there, but do um, you see it on your map there? Oh, yeah, right there. Perfect. Yep. So my map, you, if you guys want here, anyone? So here's, so here's, he leaves this district of Tyre and Sidon, right? So here we are. Boom. He's up here in this Phoenicia district, and he's, he's going this way. Left the district of Tyre and Sidon. And then where does they say that he goes? The, the Decapolis. Okay? Probably not going to have the Decapolis on your, uh, on your thing, Bobber, there. Okay? Yep. So, so the... Do you guys see? Do you guys see Damascus, or Syria? You have anything there? Aram. Yep. 
So, so do you see Aram or the, the, uh, the Sea of Galilee? So just north of that, so the, this area right here, just, just north of, of the Sea of Galilee, this area right here, bam, this area right here is the Decapolis. Bam, okay? That's the Decapolis. So the Decapolis means, the Decapolis means, the, the Decapolis means, yeah, bam, you got it, you got it, you're perfect. The Decapolis means the 10 cities, the 10 districts. Why is this important? <laughs> Why is this important? You didn't think we're going to be looking at maps today, but it is. It's so important. Okay, so Jesus, he goes north, he goes north, He's here in this region of Tyre and Sidon, and he comes north to cross over and then to go south. He could have, he could have just kind of walked across. So for, for millennia, even till today, millennia, people think that Mark made, made this up. That's why I started with understanding who Mark is, because Mark didn't make it up. St. Peter was there. And St. Peter told him exactly what Jesus did. Amen? So, so it's important for us to know what, where Jesus is going and what he's doing. Okay? It's right by, the, right by the Sea of Galilee, just north of, right by the Mediterranean Sea, just north of Galilee. And so Jesus is healing. He heals the Syrophoenician woman. He's going into Gentile territory. And so uh, the, um, the, another, so we just read from the, uh, um, the other, uh, historian Eusebius, the, there's a Jewish historian named Josephus who tells that those of Tyre, he writes, he's a Jewish historian, he's writing at, at the time of Jesus, all of his archives, they, we still have a ton of his archives dating back 2,000 years, he's a Jewish historian. So that's, how, that's a lot of how we know about the Passover, what went on there, we know the Roman kings, the Jewish kings, all of it from this historian Josephus. He says that the, the, the inhabitants of Tyre were bitter enemies of Jesus, of the Jews. They hated the Jews, and they would kill them on sight. So Jesus doesn't go around. He goes right into the, into the throat of battle. He goes right into, right into harm's way. He, it doesn't make sense, right? That's why people think Mark just made it up. He's going, why not just go around? Mark is, people, a lot of scholars even today would say, Mark is geographically inept. He doesn't get it. <laughs> kind of like us. We, we can't find Navarre on a, on a map at all. Okay? So Jesus goes to the Decapolis. We said it's the 10 cities, these 10 towns, the region of, uh, of, of the Decapolis too was, uh, was Gentile territory. Okay? Why is Jesus going there? We heard it, we heard it in, the, in the gospel today because there are towns that need the kingdom of God preached to them. But, I missed it to close my Bible, but Jesus tells the Syrophoenician woman, doesn't he? What does he say? He says, I came only for the lost sheep of Israel. Right? I'll get my verse for you. Let the children eat first. Um, he, said, he said to her, let the, ch verse 27, 727. Um, he said to her, let the children be fed first, for it is not right to take the food of the children and give it to dogs. Okay? So in other, other, other scriptures too, it says that I, can't, I, I was sent for the lost children of Israel. So this is a beginning journey where Jesus, at the, end of his, at the end of his life, at the ascension, what does Jesus say? He says, go out and baptize all the nations. So the nations are the Gentiles. The, na the nations are the non-Jews. So Jesus is showing them how it's done. He's showing us how it's done. You go right into the face of battle, right into the, the face of the, the, the throat of the enemy. He's going right there into, into the midst of it, okay? So he's confronted by, by this, this deaf man, okay? So the, 
The people brought to him a deaf man. What people? Gentiles. Okay? So they're in need too. They're in need. They're in need. Jesus just called this deaf man's sister, <laughs> let's say. Uh, he just called her a dog, her, co- her cousin, let's say. He just called her a dog. They bring this deaf man to him with a speech impediment. He begged him and begged him to lay his hand, and they begged him to lay his hand on him. Well, why would they hurt him? Yeah, yeah. 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 Otherwise, first of all, they wouldn't have you would, him there. Yeah. And then they could delay him. Yep. Um, <clears throat> they were instructed to stay only in Jewish territory. I be- yeah. Another hand came up. But nonetheless, right? So I was just looking at, and this is a terrible analogy, so forgive me. I was just looking at, um, at uh, the, the, the state football rankings. Father Jim loves high school football, right? So we can talk high school football. So I was just looking at, at high school football rankings. And Lake Orion is one of the best teams in the state. And word track trickles out, and Clarkston's really good, and Clarkston lost to Belleville, and Belleville's the number one team in the state, all of that. So it's like we, we, know, we know traits. We know what's going on with the football team over in Belleville and Clarkston so that when we play them, guess what? You know, we can, we can meet them. So, so word travels, obviously, internet generation, terrible analogy but nonetheless like so we we know things that are happening in other towns right so they 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 heard this holy man um they heard this uh, of this holy man uh, who who's healing so big key takeaway here so this deaf man comes so the word deaf uh means in an ancient day like one who was deaf also couldn't speak, okay? It's just, they're, they're just, it's a common, even to this day, if you can't hear, you can't speak. Uh, so deaf and dumb, you know, we, we use that phrase. Uh, so the word for uh, inability to speak, everyone can try to say this with me, is mogilalos, mogilalos in Greek. Mogil alos, which is which means inability to speak. Inability to speak. Just going back to the first reading, just think of the fear of an inability to speak. Okay, so it is this. This is the word that Mark uses here. Mogil alos, for deaf, inability to speak. It is the exact same word that's used in Isaiah in the exact in the exact reading in the exact uh, in the exact same context okay but here's the most important point it is the only time that it's used in the entire old testament and this is the only time that it's used in the entire new testament in in greek so so the 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 parallel, the direct comparison that Mark is trying to drive home this point that Isaiah is prophesying about, Isaiah is prophesying to a Jewish people, right? Isaiah does not say that the Messiah will come and open the ears of the deaf and give sight to the blind of the nations, (laughs) of the Gentiles. But where does Jesus make it happen at? He's bringing it to those who are most in bondage, to those most in need. That he's opening up the, the, the ears, the mind, and the soul, most importantly, to understand the saving power of God. So, uh, be open to uh, Mogalalos. You need to say something? Yeah, yeah. So then Jesus does something unique, right? Fing- so 
it's a, it's a six-step six process. But first notice is that before the, the six-step process of placing the fingers, spitting, tongue, looking up, groaning, and speaking, that's the six-step process. I guess we could call it seven, seven-step process. He takes the guy off by himself. That's unique. It's different. Jesus heals in all these different ways. He heals at a, at a, at a distance. He heals with, by the, ga the, the, uh, the garment of hem of his, uh, his garment. Here he takes the guy off by himself, which too, you know, that it, 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 could, it could point to a lot of things that I've come away, I've come and stepped away, I've come to this Gentile territory, and I'm taking you with me, a symbolic gesture of that, that it's you and I, I'm going to break into your life personally. Um, so the, so the, again, six step process, you can write this down, finger, spit, tongue, look up, groan, speak. Okay, so many of Jesus's healings, they, they do take place in public view, but here again, Jesus takes this guy off by himself. So this, this seemingly minute detail intuitively understands or, you know, understands this unique need that every single one of us has to have a personal, direct, unique, intimate love for Jesus. That he wants you. You know, and that, that's not getting all fluffy buffy and, you know, personal relationship with Jesus stuff. But it's true. <laughs> that's what he wants. Right? He wants that, and that's what the, the sacraments give us. Um, for some people, you know, it, it, the private encounter is, is, is different. Um, but Jesus here ministers to this, to, to this man and to you and me one-on-one. -on -one. Like we're not, as I like to say, I, I, I've heard it said, I shouldn't say it, I mean, I've stolen it, but I, I say it all the time, uh, that Jesus didn't come to save a crowd. He came to save me, and he came to save you in the crowd. Right? He, didn't, he didn't just save, he didn't just create a church. He died on the cross, created the church, so that I could be saved, so that I could come to know the glory and power of God. Amen? So, uh, so in that, so now he's ministering to this guy one-on-one, -on -one, and so Jesus performs this healing with, with all these steps. It's so unique. It goes step by step, seven steps. As if almost like, I, I mentioned today even in my homily, you know, it's like a movie scene. Peter walks in the bedroom of, of I'm sorry, Jesus walks in the bedroom of Peter's mother-in-law, and you can just feel the gripping tension. He stands over her, and he rebukes her fever. This is, this is a movie scene that we're witnessing. We're, we're standing on the edge of the Decapolis and the Ten Cities, and I'm one of the 12, and I'm like, why are we here? We're going to get killed. And now he grabs the guy, and he takes him off to the side. Did he just stick his fingers in his ears? What's he doing? Oh, my gosh, he's spitting. What's he going to do next? We're watching it happen, right? So, like, kind of these, Jesus is speaking a sign language to this deaf man because the guy can't hear. He can't speak. So he's speaking his language, isn't he? Isn't he? He's speaking something specific for him. So after taking him aside, Jesus sticks the, his fingers in the man's ears. He spits. He touches his tongue. He looks up to heaven. Then he groans. The deaf man can't even hear the sigh. He can't hear the groan, right? So it's not for him. Right? It's Jesus who's sighing for his own sake in his own humanity and his divinity and who he is. He's just sighing. We don't know why. But then he says, Ephetetha. So how do we interpret the spitting? Uh, so when, one of the books said that, you know, you can interpret the spitting, um, should be interpreted as Jesus spitting on his own finger and then touching the man's tongue. So both both his impaired organs are healed by Jesus' direct touch. Um, in the ancient world, saliva was, and, and I preached on this before too, that, that saliva was always seen as, as therapeutic. And Jesus looking up to heaven is a, is a, 
a gesture of prayer, you know, during the Eucharistic prayer. Uh, I always use Eucharistic prayer number one. You know, we, Jesus took the bread and looking up to heaven to his almighty Father. So the rubric literally says, and in, in Latin it's uh, said oculus uh, to, to, to sena, to, to cello, to turn your eyes to heaven. So you turn your, you gaze towards heaven. So, so the, the rubric literally calls for me to look to heaven, to look heavenward. So this is a prayer where, where Jesus is looking upward. Um, uh, and then, you know, he's, 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 Jesus is, is expressing his, his reliance on the Father. It's the only place in all of the Gospels where Jesus is said to, to groan, to sigh. And again, you know, he's sighing, he's groaning from his heart perhaps, you know, just with a lament, a groan, and it's, this is different than the, than the translation of groan when we see he comes to the tomb of Lazarus. It's different. It's a different Greek word here. Um, perhaps, you know, this is a grief, again, over just, again, kind of what I preached on today, just a, um, a, of agony of the fall, agony of, 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 the, of the sickness that's there, okay? Um, we'll be mindful of the time. Well, in the <coughs> last verse, uh, 37, it says, they were exceedingly astonished, and they said, quote, he has done all things well. He makes the deaf hear, and he is free. That sentence, he has done all things well. All they saw was him heal the deaf mute. How did they know? Or why would they interject this sentence that he has done all things. Yeah, um, good question. I think it is, uh, you know, if you're living in darkness, and you ever heard of you ever, you ever heard of the allegory Plato's Cave? You know, there. I don't want to get too way off topic here again, but so there. The, uh, Plato writes this, uh, writes obviously well before Jesus, but he writes this allegory of the cave and that people were living in a cave and all they knew was experiential life in the cave. And then they saw from the shadow of the fire other things on the other side of the wall. They saw people walking, they saw animals, and so their understanding was the projected image on the wall or on the, the shadow that they saw. They were chained and they, they, they were only chained in the cave and that's all that they could see. One of the guys escapes. This is Plato. <laughs> this is not Father Steve. So one of the guys escapes and then experiences people and animals for the very first time. And what does he do? He comes back and he tells everyone, you're never going to believe it. There's real people just like us. And that's what we've been looking at all this time. This is Plato, not Jesus, not Father Steve. And the people are like, we're just going to stay in the cave. And the guy's like, why do you want to stay in the cave? Well, because we like the cave. And I like what I think that is. So then the guy's like, all right, I'm going back out with the normal people. So he goes back out and lives life with them. So bringing that in the, in the Christian context to answer your, your question then thing, he has done all things well. It's, it is this proclamation of we've seen the light. You are, you are the one who's created us. You're the one who gives life. You're the one who heals. That, that, in, that in that encounter... That one-on-one -on -one encounter that, even though it wasn't them, they've met the living God, these Gentiles, the ones who brought, who had enough faith, just like the Syrophoenician woman that we don't hear about, that had enough faith to say, can you heal our friend? He's deaf, right? So they, you've done all, so it, it's, 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 a, it's a proclamation of praise to say, if you can do this, you can rise from the dead. If you can do this, you can, you can save me. 
I read that the bigger part of the miracle was that the man could speak because it says any speech pathologist will tell you that somebody that has not spoken mm. knows deaf, their tongue wouldn't be able to even form the words. And when you think of how long it takes an, a child <coughs> to learn how to speak. That's a great point. And then in here it says um, that he said immediately, which is Matthew, um, yep. or Mark, I mean, immediately, the urgent, immediately the man's ears were open, his speech impediment was removed. Mm -hmm. So what did the man say to him? Yeah. I do and just. Excuse me. No, no. La ladies first, yeah. So uh, you sh you re we're, we're lockstep. You see that? So the <laughs> effa, the effatetha. That's right. The effatetha. So um, so uh, it's important, right? So this is this is an Aramaic word. We heard another Aramaic word recently too in the gospel. You remember what that was? Talitha kum, right? So this, so these are the only two instances, I believe, where where we hear Aramaic that, that's been preserved. It's rested so much that it that that Peter remembered it, that he said it, gave it to Mark, that Mark remembered it, that it wasn't just like I'll be opened. No, Mark, you're writing, you're writing in Greek, write Ephetetha. <laughs> it was it was powerful. So that is to say. Jesus' word is power. Let there be light, and there is light. Be opened, and his, and his ears are opened. Okay? So the, uh, so the, um, so the Ephetatha, um, again, I got something here. When is it? So his faculties are restored to full functioning, and, uh, and, in, in that he was able to communicate immediately. That's what I wanted to say just kind of on that. So in the baptismal rite, we, we pray what's called the ephetetha over the babies. So it happens after the baptism. So they're, they're baptized. Um, I asked the parents, is this your will that, you sh that your child, sh little Bobby McGillicuddy, should receive baptism in the faith of the church which we have all professed with you? They say, yes, I baptize the baby. Baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, little Bobby McGillicuddy. So then after the, ba the baby's uh, brought forward, he, we anoint the, uh, the crown of his head with oil. Okay, anoint the baby's head with oil. And Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has freed you, little Bobby McGillicuddy, from sin. He's given you new birth by water and the Holy Spirit, and he's joined you to his people. He now anoints you with the oil of salvation. Then we put the white garments on the baby, to symbolize his Christian dignity, foreshadowing of the book of Revelation that those, the 170, who stand before God with white garments on, it's a symbol there that, they're, that, that we clothe ourselves in Christ on the day of our death. That's why we drape the, uh, the white garment on the casket. Then the candle, Godfather, we light the candle, receive the light of Christ, a prayer over the child again with the candle. Then I go over to the baby and I pray what's called the, uh, the ephetetha over him, the be opened, okay? And I, I make the sign of the cross over, um, over his ears. The Lord Jesus who made the deaf hear and the mute speak and then over his lips. I make the sign of the cross over his lips. The Lord Jesus who made the deaf hear and the mute speak, may he soon grant you to receive his word with your ears and profess faith with your lips to the glory and praise of God the Father. Isn't that beautiful? So we're, the be opened, as you receive a baptism, is meant that we are called to hear the word that we do, we study here, that we're called to go out and to share the word that we've met him, that we know him and that we love him. Amen? That is not meant or called to, uh, to die with us, um, that we're called to, to share. And again, that's the whole point of uh, Wednesday in the Word.
And we'll always have Wednesday in the Word, and that we're called just to, uh, to make sure that we, uh, that we share it. Thoughts, comments, questions? Your hand went up. Oh, this is so interesting, too. Um, the six-step process and um, about Jesus touching the tongue of the mute man. And, of course, whenever we receive the Eucharist, as you alluded to earlier, he touches our tongue, and, of mm. course, we take him in. And um, opening the ears, etc. But he's so revolutionary beyond that, uh, as you said, about taking the man aside. And uh, in last week, uh, we heard all about the importance that the scribes and Pharisees, uh, the hypocrites, really, um, you know, with the washing of, of um, the hands before eating, etc. And now this week, it's all about not the letter of the law, but the spirit of the law through Jesus. That's good. I was just, the, my attention was drawn to this. He said, don't tell anyone. And the more he said, don't do it, the more he said, do it. Yeah. The more they did it. Yep. And I think that fits our evangelization, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You can't help but say something. So that's called the messianic secret. Couldn't cover everything. Uh, so that's called the messianic secret. And Jesus, throughout the Gospels, primarily in Mark, so it's a slew of times in Mark, probably four or five times maybe, I, I'm not a certain, that Jesus tells them not to say anything. And the, and the purpose and reason ultimately, again, scholars and church fathers and theologians for millennia have, have you know, speculated but ultimately, again, it goes back to what he said to the Syrophoenician woman, I have come for the lost sheep of Israel. Don't tell them, don't tell them, I'm not coming for them. I'm coming for them, right? Who cares if they know right now? I'll, they'll know when I send my apostles, go out and tell the world. But how is it that we cannot share? <laughs> Dude's, so he's going to evangelize even by, by the mere fact that he's able to speak perfectly now and that he wasn't able before, so he's evangelizing by his mere actions. Who did this to you? It was Jesus. And just before this context, the, the scribes and the Pharisees were giving Jesus more flack, more problems. They were being hypocrites. And so Jesus had, had said to the 12, shake the dust off your feet. Mm. People are not receptive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's like, these Jews that really should know are not accepting me yeah. and are questioning because they can't acknowledge that there's a higher authority than their own authority, the ego issue. And so he goes someplace as far away from them as yep. he could to the people who are going to be more receptive. And in terms of the speaking being the harder, the bigger miracle, the man could speak immediately. What is the hardest thing for us, even if we feel we, we know the truth? It's to speak the truth. Mm. And the more we study the word and get to know it, the more we're just going to feel compelled. Like, how can I not share this? Yeah. So that's why you're going to be here next week for Wednesday in the Word. <laughs> Soak in the scriptures. Truly, you know, so it is, it is the salve for a wounded heart. It is the... Uh, it is... Um, our strength and our shield it is what gives us gives us courage in a uh, in a world that's uh, that's crumbling just to to read god's word to soak in it it gives us hope so let's uh, and fear not right we hear in that that first reading fear not uh isaiah says god says through isaiah which uh which we can continue to uh, to hear the good news of jesus and there is always wednesday in the word so Stop asking me if we're having Wednesday in the Word. There is always Wednesday in the Word. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death, amen. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.